Hello, Barnes & Noble Book Club. It is so good to see everyone. I cannot believe that we're already at our last meeting for 2022. I don't know how that happened. I'm Miwa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Barnes & Noble's podcast, Poured Over. I'm with Shannon DeVito, our director of books, and of course, the woman of the hour, Katie. Katie, 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 Katie Hayes. Sorry, I'm really like saying that. Uh, the author of The Cloisters, which is our November book club pick. And wow, there is so much love for this book. There is so, so much love for this book. But before we get started, you guys, some housekeeping. If you've joined us before, you know, this is a spoiler conversation. We have lots and lots of spoilers. If you have not read yet the book and you are not cool with spoilers, I would say you might want to re uh, watch this video once it goes up onto the Barnes & Noble YouTube channel. Um, if you have questions and submitted them when you were registering for the event during using Eventbrite, I have your questions. If you want to drop new questions in the chat, go ahead. I'll be monitoring the chat while we do the event. If you want to use the Q&A module at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can use that as well. And folks, if you do use that, people can upvote your questions. So that'll help me see them faster if you want to use that. So you have lots of options. And before we get to Katie, who I'm so excited to talk to, I'm going to ask Shannon why we chose the Cloisters for the BNN Book Club for November. As soon as I read this, I was, my first question was, it's a debut, which made me even more excited because A, I can't wait for what's coming next, hopefully. Um, but B, the atmosphere of this book, the, it really lures you in and the back half just hit home so hard. I think it's um, the looming darkness, the seduction in the occult. Um, it's braided with academic exception. Um, exception and obsession and amazingness and um I just felt like it was book club catnip and you know who doesn't love tarot right now so I I absolutely had to pick it for book club I totally get that all right Katie I'm not the only person who wants to know this I know I'm not the only person who wants to know this but how did the cloisters start for you because I felt I live in New York and I felt like you were walking me through my city I thought you were walking me through the cloisters, which I know reasonably well. I mean, I could probably know a lot of places in New York better, but you, I think, have spent some time here, even though now you're based in California, yeah? Yeah, you know, I actually have never lived in New York, but I've what? spent- What? Yeah. <laughs> I'm married, however, to, to a New Yorker, which always helps. Um, but I had spent quite a bit of time at the cloisters, mm -hmm. and to me, the museum always felt like this wonderful- low hanging fruit for a novel, to be mm -hmm. honest, because it's such a magical and unusual location. And I feel like it was really interesting to me that no novelist had tried to set a story there. And so the setting really came to me immediately as this place that felt really unusual within the city and that has such a distinctive character to it. I, I really mm -hmm love that deeply gothic, very stony, um, wonderful gardens. I, I thought this is really a place that's crying out to be transported into fiction. So if you haven't lived in New York, then how did you learn about the cloisters? Was it while you were in school? Because you've studied art history and you, in fact, teach art history, don't you? Yeah, so I had visited the Cloisters back in 2016. Okay. I had gone to grad school on the East Coast. I okay. went to Williams for my master's in art history. And we did go down to the city quite a bit. So I spent okay. quite a bit of time in New York, despite never having lived there. Mm -hmm. the time. And for me, the museum had always just kind of captured my imagination in a way that mm -hmm. even places like the Met is so overwhelming, MoMA is yeah. overwhelming, the Whitney, the Guggenheim. I mean, New York has such an absolute luxury of wealth of museums. I mean, I'm so jealous. But I think for me, the cloisters always felt like this place that was really overlooked, but so unbelievably mm -hmm. unusual in the city of right. Manhattan. So I think that's really what drew me. Yep to setting a story there. So we start with place, but Anne, our girl Anne, I'm not the only person I'm sure who's very fond of Anne and we have questions about some other people in the cast, but let's start with Anne. Was Anne the first character who showed up for you? Yeah, because I think for me, the voice of this novel really came very quickly to mm -hmm, me when I mm -hmm. sat down and started writing it. And sometimes that's the case. Sometimes the voice is on the page in the first draft, and sometimes it takes quite a few drafts to get down to where you want to really be starting. Mm -hmm. And for me, her voice was always the strongest as this kind of outsider. And I think you know, perhaps for me, I was drawing a little bit on my own experience of having, I'm a native Californian. I grew mm -hmm. up here and I moved to the East Coast for school and I was 
really shocked by how different the entire environment was. And so I think for me, certainly drawing on some of that was, was useful and interesting. And I really think for Anne, there was just kind of a voice always guiding me through the novel. And she was really the character who did that. Yeah. Okay, Shannon, I know you've talked about the atmosphere and I know, I know, and we've talked about it a lot in the office too, but what do you love most about Anne? Cause let's face it, she is our girl. She is our girl and she's very much a fish out of water, but she's yep. unafraid to just keep trying mm -hmm. and she's interested and she wants to build these relationships, even if she's not fully sure mm -hmm. what's happening around her. I think it's that it, there's almost a fearlessness of just diving in head first, even though you are unfamiliar with an area and an, and an academia mm -hmm. and, a, and a person and a relationship and just willing to try. I think that's why I felt connected to her. And also, frankly, um, I have a fondness for Leo because he can grow things and I can't. And I know <laughs> he's growing drugs for housewives and things like that. But I was just like, you know what? Uh, plants plants are great and I, I wish I could but I respect the characters who can <laughs> <laughs> Katie I know this is one of those questions where it's like you're going to ask me to pick a favorite child are you kidding me out of the non Anne characters was there someone you really really loved writing yeah you know I truthfully Leo is my favorite character mm -hmm. okay. in the whole novel because oh, I think right. okay. in ways, I'm really jealous of his um sort of anarchist sensibilities and his lawlessness. And I think yeah. for me, that was really fun to write. Yep. And I also think it's, I'm really fascinated by the question of ambition. And so I'm really interested too in the way Leo's own creative ambitions play off Anne's ambitions and Rachel's ambitions and how all of these kind of characters are really, they're in there striving and kind of hustling to get somewhere. And I, I think that's something that for me was really fun to write in the case of Leo, because he's such a, a kind of different ambition than the girls and the women in the story are. So he felt punk. He, you he's know, very punk he rock. He's punk. very punk yeah. rock. I mean, but, you know, Dolores Moreno just dropped a question in the chat here. She said, Anne is great, but who has she become by the end of the novel? Yeah. I think the thing for me is that I think Anne was always that person. Yeah, I, I do too. I really do. That even when she kind of gets to New York, and I think even though she's sort of finding her way, I think she's not becoming someone new. She's fully stepping into herself, is the way I've always. Yeah about it. And I think, you know, it's that kind of time period after college when you're in your first job that you're starting to kind of really figure out who you are as an adult and what you're willing to do and what you're capable of doing. And I think in an atmosphere like the cloisters, you're able to push yourself even further into mm -hmm. the question of what am I capable of? What am I starting to believe about myself and about my future? And I think, you know, that's one of the things I find really interesting about the novel. You know, that was one of my favorite pieces. I mean, I loved the whole where are we going and what's happening and who are these people, but writing about ambition is hard to do well without sounding sort of uh, borderline cliche, you know, and you, you pull it off in a way where I'm completely invested in how Anne and Rachel Rachel, we need to talk, we need to talk about Rachel people, um, how they see their careers and their abilities and where they want to go and how they want to get there. And that's not something that women traditionally have been allowed to do in literature and film and everything else, because there's this idea that if we're ambitious, then, you know, we're a little catty, we're a little this, we're a little that, you know, it's okay to be ambitious. It really is. Why shouldn't we want for ourselves? <laughs> It was great to see, but female friendship, female friendship. I have to say, Rachel made me a little nervous from the start. She made me a little nervous. She made my skin itch a little bit. Where did Rachel come from? Yeah, you know, I think I'm really interested in the kind of contrast that Rachel and Anne present, both in mm -hmm. terms of their background, but also just in some ways in terms of their personality. But I also think that there is this kind of sense, I saw someone just drop this in the chat a second ago, mm -hmm. there is this sense too that Anne is kind of moving into Rachel's position, mm -hmm. She's almost becoming Rachel in a sense as the novel progresses. And I, I think that's something that's really fascinating is, you know, Rachel's incredibly cutthroat and maybe mm -hmm. it's being in the proximity to that level of um, kind of willingness to do whatever it takes that makes Anne question what she's willing to do. And so I think for me, Rachel is this kind of um, 
bet noir character almost in a lot of kind of campus novels, right? This really rich kind of undergrad in many ways who has all has everything basically handed to her, but wants even more. And so I'm I'm also really interested in that question of, you know, women who have a lot but want even more. Mm-hmm. And why so often we tend to demonize that and why, you know, that makes in a lot of ways for an easy villain character. And in my mind, really Rachel is is never a villain. It's just that this is an incredibly com- competitive environment and only mm-hmm. one of them is going to survive. And so who is that going to be? Okay, so am I the only person who thought Rachel was a sociopath? <laughs> I had a moment where I thought she was, a, there were a couple of moments where I was like, this girl is not programmed like other people. <laughs> no, but I definitely think, not. Yeah, and I think that honestly, the, the Rachel Ann relationship and the sense of foreboding you could feel from the beginning and the the kind of tenuousness of their, and like that is what drove so much of the yeah. propulsion of this novel for me was that juxtaposition of the two characters mm-hmm. and, their, and their different directions of ambition whether where they're coming from or where they want to go they're they're different but they are each looking for success so I, it's yeah you know and marie bova just dropped a note in the chat too yes but Anne is always smarter than we think more intuitive than we give her credit for initially and mm-hmm. i think that's true i mean rachel really does not want anything to do with wait for it the tarot cards which I want to talk about the art. I want to talk about the research. I mean, obviously, we're going to come back to the relationships. I know oh, that's so beautiful. beautiful. Sorry, and actually, yeah. someone did ask um, who designed the beautiful art inside the cover. That's Roberta Austin, who may or may not be here. I didn't see her name pop up in the chat. But um, do we know? I mean, the publisher just put it in there for us, which is delightful. But do we have any idea who the designer was? I don't. I'm not sure. Okay. I, um, I, they put these end papers in our exclusive edition yeah, and so I beautiful. could not have been happier because they are so stunning and um yeah we'll have to find out because it's perfect yeah it really they did such a great job but katie where what's your specialty in art I, is it early renaissance like is this part of your world or did you just say um, i want to know more about this because it's the cloisters you know what's so funny is actually I'm a modernist. Um, oh wow! Okay, I'm not a medievalist at all, but I have some good friends who are medievalists and who mm-hmm. let who have over the years let me be basically a tourist in their field of stuff. <laughs> I have That's awesome. Really enjoyed, and I have to say, you know, the the kind of ironic thing about this novel is that actually when you're talking about art historians, I feel like people get nicer the further back in time you go. So medievalists are some of the nicest happiest, loveliest art historians you'll ever meet. I mean, I feel in some ways a little bad giving them such a a tough rap in in the novel because they are almost universally a wonderful group. So (laughs) I think that um, I kind of came to the topic of this novel from the perspective of wanting to set a book at the cloisters and wanting to really think about the question of randomness and fate and chance. Right. And I felt like tarot cards and sort of their medieval history, their early Renaissance history Mm -hmm. was a great way to start to think about that because I'm, I'm really interested in the question, not only what are we capable of believing in, whether that's astrology or tarot or Mm -hmm manifesting or a really charismatic con man. I'm also really interested in kind of the question of how much is out there waiting for us, right? What's destined for us? What do we choose for ourselves? And kind of how those those answers are often really soft and fuzzy. And so Mm -hmm. that's really how I kind of came to the question of tarot and the question of medieval art history was actually kind of through asking these questions, you know, what would you be capable of believing in? Would you be able to kind of believe this deck of tarot cards could tell the future? Mm -hmm. And what kind of environment would need to be happening for that to be possible? Shannon, is tarot part of your life outside of work? So kind of Mm -hmm. in an ancillary way so my mom really enjoys tarot so Mm -hmm. I kind of grew up around it but I've but I have never done a tarot reading and that's why I think I found pieces of this so fascinating delving into the history of it and people's relationship with tarot whether choosing to kind of let an ending be which kind of harkens back to the ending of this Mm -hmm. book or kind of searching for the end so you feel a sense of peace I think there's so many different ways to approach Mm -hmm. a relationship with something like tarot cards I think they're just as pieces of art they're so beautiful and they Mm -hmm. can be kind of um 
identified and engaged with in so many different ways. I just find it fascinating. So I think it's something I'll probably kind of dive deeper into just from nature of seeing so many things kind of pop up in the last few years about people's relationship with it. I will also throw out that Aaron Morgenstern, who wrote The Night Circus and Starless Sea, now has a tarot deck that we have, um, that she illustrated. And it's really kind of cool looking and I was not expecting it, but it made me, you actually, Katie, your deck in this book made me think of it because just the style of illustration mm-hmm. just is sort of, you know, you're a bookseller, you connect dots, what can I say? But hey, I wanna work in two audience questions because they, they build on this little bit of conversation we've been having. So Sarah Kaufman dropped in the Q&A, at times Anne did not feel in control of her decisions. Did you feel this way while writing? Oh my goodness. You know, I really think that there's something, it's funny. I'm a very practical person. Um, Mm -hmm. If you know me in my day-to-day life, I'm not the sort of person who believes in astrology or even puts that much stock in tarot, but I do think writing is a practice that is in some ways very woo-woo or very Mm -hmm. magical. And so I think Mm -hmm. that there is this sense that you don't always know where a character's going or whether or not they're reliable to you as the writer, as much as they're reliable even to the reader. And so for me, I think with Anne, you know, there is this kind of sense that you're discovering it as you go, as you're writing it. Um, So for me, I was kind of sussing out really where Anne's story was going and what she was believing and and whether or not she was in charge and and empowered in the moment Mm -hmm. as I was writing it. Um, And I think you know, I think in the end, at the very end of the novel, I think there there has to be this sense that she mm-hmm. is in charge and has made these decisions. But I think leading up to that, there are sort of all these moments in the novel where I found myself asking the question, you know, was this something she chose or was this something that kind of came to her? I mean, even just staying a little longer in the HR office to have Patrick walk by and offer right. her the job or, you know, the decision while waiting in the antiques sh- store to kind of look a little bit more carefully at the card and kind of start to understand mm-hmm. that there might be something more there. I think for me, there is always there are always these moments where the question is, you know, is this chance? Is it fate? Is it is it free will? I don't know how much of them are actually inseparable, though, because don't we tend to ascribe meaning to things after the fact? I mean, it's sort of the human condition to do that. And I'm I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm maybe I'm just being persnickety about this, but I sort of feel like we've always got our fingers on stuff. (laughs) I think that's true. And I also think these days, you know, we're talking a little bit about how tarot resonates with people Mm -hmm. these days. And I think there is this sense that in today's society, we've had sort of a, an attrition of religion in a lot of ways and a kind of rise of new spiritualism. And I think Mm -hmm. there's this, you know, I think in some ways what you're talking about is a desire to give meaning to something and to assign meaning to it and give our lives a kind of structure around that. And I think the tarot is a really interesting practice in that sense that it offers, um, it offers both structure and meaningfulness and the ability to kind of, um, you know, create a practice that feels almost Mm -hmm. totemic or religious in some way. As you were writing this and kind of connecting the dots, and especially with the research around tarot, did you find yourself more attuned to the idea of what tarot is or the idea of fortune or kind of more open to it? Or it kind of reestablished that like, you know, writing is the magic and this is everything I'm researching for said magic. No, you know, I think the funny thing is that actually um, throughout the process of writing this novel, I I spent a lot of time researching historical tarot decks, especially Mm -hmm. decks that came out in the early 15th century and 16th century and kind of those Renaissance tarot decks. But I also bought myself a a traditional Raider Waite tarot deck, which is one of the most standard decks to come out of the sort of spiritualist movement in the 19th century and early 20th century. And I would give myself readings and scare myself senseless with this tarot deck. (laughs) Oh, and I, no. I say I'm very practical and I say I have everything kind of organized and under control. And then you give me one kind of woo woo thing and I can easily just go right off the rails. So I think for me, you know, I really, I did enjoy working with tarot in some ways as a writing practice during working on the book. You know, I was, it's really interesting to think about the imagery and the symbolism mm-hmm. of the decks of tarot and the continuity of that from the 15th century to present and kind of why these images exist. And so for me, I spent a lot of time, I think, thinking about that and looking at these images and using kind of my 
my skill set and my tools as an art historian to think about, you know, what these mean and how that meaning came down to us. And also sometimes you should, you're just tired and would like someone else to make a decision. <laughs> I mean, I realized last night, for instance, I was just kind of like, I don't feel like cooking. I needed my dude to just decide what he wanted for dinner and do it because I just couldn't make a decision. I was like, ah, it's not the perfect analogy, but it does lead me to our next question. I'm curious about how fate influences or influenced by the characters. Is Anne a tragic character without agency or does she create her own fate? And that's from Christine, uh, Christine Swerendoff. You know, I think that's a great question. And I think in this case, the answer is it's both, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think the novel really asks the question, are we in control of everything? Mm -hmm. And I, I think the answer has to be no, right? In order for there to be this overriding sense of fate, there have to be some things out there that we can't see that are waiting for mm -hmm. us, both good and bad. And so I think in some ways she is a victim of fate mm -hmm. as much as she is empowered by it. And I think, you know, ultimately that's the double edged sword that a lot of philosophers during the Renaissance struggled with when they talk about fate versus free will is the sense that, you know, you want there to be fate to have this kind of big sense of spiritualism in the world. But on the other hand, you need there to be free will so that people can choose their own destinies and kind of make amends for things. And I think in that sense, I really always wanted the novel to basically have it both ways, right? right. That Anne is Anne is both at the mercy of fate and is also mm -hmm. leveraging it to, to its hilt every chance she gets. Yeah, Shannon, did you have an aha moment when you were, I mean, there's so many twists and turns in the cloisters, but did you have a moment where suddenly you were just like, oh, I am in it. I am in, I am in this in a way that I was not necessarily expecting to be this. I mean, you're a full body reader. <laughs> Murder always drags me in. Yeah, okay. <laughs> if there's, if there's okay. death, like, yeah, I get it. But I will say the, one of the most one of the things that really stuck with me and thank God this is a book club discussion and, and not a spoiler free conversation really is the way she wraps up the end where she talks about the shape of fate and you know maybe we don't know our own shape of fate but um, you know it's it's already kind of pre-existing but she chooses not to know the ending she's making kind of an active choice in that because it is kind of this debate throughout the entire book about whether it's already predestined, so it doesn't matter. This is our fortune and it's gonna happen no matter what versus this idea of free will. And I think that's what I what I found so interesting throughout as Anne was making these decisions is it's, it's about the marriage of the two and understanding mm -hmm. there may be things that we just don't know um, and that's okay. We can still kind of have agency mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. people in relationships in, it, in our own lives because then, then it would just be so overwhelming and then you get into an existential crisis. So it's like, it's um, that that's kind of the thing I was kind of struggling with the entire book and what drew me in and it was wrapped up so, um, so beautifully, just, just the last paragraph. I was like, oh, you said it exactly how I was feeling. So was that the biggest surprise for you, Shannon, that you just, you bought in so yeah. hard to this world? I mean, yeah, you, I, knew, I'm not you knew you a, liked it. Yeah, exactly. You knew you liked it as you were reading it. It is a great story. It moves, it moves, it moves. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the emotional resonance of this story. Wow. Mm -hmm. Big wow. So Katie, can I ask, speaking of surprises, what was the biggest surprise in your research? That's a question from Tessa Floreno. Yeah, the biggest surprise in my research actually made it into the novel, which mm -hmm. is that I read this wonderful book by Mary McQuinlan Graff, who is a professor of art history, and she's she specializes in what are called astrological vaults, which are these huge ceiling paintings mm -hmm. done during the Renaissance. There used to be one in the Vatican that depict... Um, sort of the astrological signs, the constellations. So you'll have uh, Scorpio or Libra or Gemini. And her argument is, and she backs it up beautifully in this, in this uh, manuscript, that in fact, during the Renaissance, rich aristocrats and even the Pope believed that these astrological depictions, the painted versions of them, could have felicitous and positive influences on their own birth charts. Mm -hmm, so for mm -hmm. example, if you're Pope Leo and... Uh, 
um, you know, you invite someone to come sign a treaty in your astrological vault, the stars that are painted above you puts you at an advantage based on your birth chart or your natal right. chart. And the idea that painted stars would work just as well as the actual position of the stars in the celestial sky was, I mean, completely mind blowing to me and seemed incredibly bonkers and also mm -hmm. exactly the sort of thing that the Renaissance would get into. And then of course, right, all of these astrological vaults are painted over because you have the counter reformation and everybody uh... thinks like, the Renaissance has gone too far. We've got naked ladies and mythological subjects, and we're going to paint over all of this. And so, so many of these astrological vaults are actually, you know, especially the ones in the Vatican are now painted over. And it's, really fascinating to me, this idea that, and in a lot of ways, right, isn't that what a tarot card is? It's an art object mm -hmm. that you can affect you personally. And right. so I'm really interested in this idea of the kind of visual object that actually has a material impact in your life. And so mm -hmm. I think you know, during the Renaissance, it's these painted astro astrological vaults. And today it's the, the kind of actual physical tarot card in a reading. So that's definitely that I love that that's a real fact. Is there a um, is there a scene that you loved writing the most of the entire book? When as soon as you finish the scene, or as soon as you had the idea for the scene, you were like, "This is my scene." Like, you know. That is yeah, it's funny. I think there are actually two scenes that I really loved writing in the book. I love the scene where Leo is selling kind of like <laughs> leg. Um, yes. potions to like rich upper west side mm -hmm. and, like, to me that felt both totally authentic and um was just really fun to write and this kind of the juxtaposition of the hustle of the gardener doing illegal activities against the kind of affluent um you know free time housewives shopping the green market was really fun to write and then I also really enjoyed writing the scene at Long Lake when Anne gets lost in the forest because for me as someone who's a Californian I should mm -hmm. say I'm also a really big trail runner I love to run I live in the Sierra and sort of the arid California mountains mm -hmm. and my husband like I said is is from New York and I'll sometimes run when we're in New York and I just I mean, it's so oppressive. I mean, in the best possible way, but just the canopy and the kind of smells, everything kind of smells damp and redolent. And I mean, it's so much more sensory than mm -hmm. running in California where it's just the air is dry, it's sunny, you're fine. So I think <laughs> I really enjoyed that aspect of kind of building that dark, damp kind of uh, canopy of trees was really enjoyable for me. I loved that bit I, because also I wasn't sure if Anne was going to get herself out. And then of course there's Rachel and I'm like, oh, no good can come of this. No good. <laughs> and you know, there's the whole cottage thing at the camp up in the Adirondacks. I mean, <laughs> if that doesn't, I, I feel like we were underestimating Anne a little bit just because she's from Walla Walla. I mean, yeah, she has worked very hard. She knows her stuff, but yeah, her parents don't come from a lot of money. And obviously her mother is having a really hard go of things. But that moment where she sees Rachel's house, I think that's when it becomes really clear to Anne that the playing field isn't always the same for everyone. Like she knows if I just get through this year, if I get through this year and figure out someone will take me, I will get into a grad program. I just have to work really hard. But then she sees this house. Yeah. Which... And I have to say too, that one of the great things about writing this book, I, I hope people after reading it want to visit the Cloisters Museum, mm -hmm. which is incredible. But I should also say that there are some insane 19th century camps on mm -hmm. Lake upstate New York, um, from Lake George to yeah. Long Lake to Lake Placid and these places, I mean, oh my gosh, these houses are yeah. bonkers. And I just think that, you know, it was really fun in some ways to kind of construct one of those camps because they are yeah. these wonderful historic artifacts before places like the Hamptons were hot. Everyone went up to right. upstate New York and, you know, these camps are just incredible architecturally. And the fact that they've been preserved is kind of lovely. I mean, that is one of the things that I appreciate. And Leo is a little snarky about it, though. At one point, he's like, you only care if there's value assigned to something. I mean, because we know what he's been up to. But, you know, you only care if value is assigned. If there's no val if there's no perceived value, you don't care. He's not actually wrong, even though Anne does have this really deep intellectual connection to the work she's doing. Leo's not wrong. 
No, I mean, he's really not. And I think that's one of those questions too that the book has to ask is, you know, when you move from a place like Walla Walla, I should say, first of all, that Walla Walla, Washington is a lovely, lovely place it that is. I absolutely <laughs> adore. So I'm sorry if anyone here is sort of thinking that I'm down on Walla Walla. It's actually lovely, but it just also happens to house a really wonderful college that I wanted to use. So mm-hmm. um, I think that one of the things that's really interesting about working in museums broadly is this kind of understanding of, you know, you're there basically creating value, whether you're at mm-hmm. the um, doing the biennial or you're at the Met selecting what to put on display, there's this constant adjudication in the world of the arts about what has value and the kind of meaning that that creates. And, you know, in a lot of ways, it's a really complex and deeply political and um, not without kind of complications process to decide, you know, what you're going to put on display and kind of what you are going to assign as valuable. And I think that you know, Leo's totally right. And she's bought in, she's hook, line and sinker Mm. into the world of the arts in that sense, right? She, she's there to create value for herself. She's there to adjudicate value for others. And I think, you know, that's part of this sense though, of, of climbing, of wanting, of having ambition. I wanted to convey. So we have a side question about uh, Anne's dad that I'm going to come back to in a second. But I had a moment when I was reading towards the end where I was like, wait a minute, did someone arrange for dad's, Anne's dad to get hit by a car, given everything we knew at that point? And I was like, oh, my brain is clearly racing. I am clearly invested in all of this. But I did have a moment where I was like, huh, huh, is there a larger, like, <laughs> an unfortunately tragic accident? But I really liked his character. I really appreciated sort of the fact that he was self-taught And I feel like we don't necessarily get a lot of characters like that anywhere in literature. So it was kind of fun. But when did you realize you needed Anne's dad to be who he was? Or did he just kind of show up like that? You know, he was always someone in my mind who was that kind of autodidact, that self-taught polyglot who was interested in languages. And I'm, I think in general, I'm really interested in people who pursue their own passions and kind of interests outside of a a format of formal education. And so I think for me, he ended up being a character that really allowed me to pursue that. I think Leo Mm -hmm. to a certain extent is that same character. And I, I was always kind of planning on making him, um, this really cornerstone, this cornerstone in Anne's life that helped her kind of learn all of these aspects outside of her own formal education. Uh, But I think for me, what was really interesting is actually, I didn't sort of see the twist of Anne being the one to have tragically hit him coming until I was very far into the novel. And then it kind of snuck up on me as this sort of sudden realization that 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 was, of course, the kind of faded moment in her life that Mm -hmm brings her here and kind of makes her capable of doing what she needs to do next. So Angela Tavaglioni, I hope I'm saying your last name correctly, Angela, I'm sorry if I didn't. Did Anne's unintentional involvement in her father's death somehow make her more able to keep all those secrets? Yeah, I I personally think that her involvement in her father's death is also what makes her able ultimately to kill Rachel yeah. in the end. Oh, or without to, a doubt. Or to set Rachel up in a situation where she may or may not die, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that it's that kind of um, experience that's so traumatic and so formative that really yeah. kind of tips you over, you know, at that point you have nothing left to lose. And I think there is this kind of sense in Anne as she comes into New York and as she's working at the cloisters, she doesn't have anything to lose, right? The only, the only fate that awaits her is to go back to wait tables in, you know, Eastern Washington. And so I think she really kind of the death of her father is the thing that sets her on this path. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, and Bonnie Palmer said, love the book, but was disturbed by how abruptly Anne decides to tell the police about Leo's theft. Um, I don't, Bonnie, I'm going to slightly disagree with you for a second, because I, that felt like a moment where we were seeing Anne in her new sort of form, as it were, because it was just such an awful thing to do. And that's, that was another moment where I'm like, oh, Rachel's a sociopath. She's a total sociopath and she's rubbing off on Anne. (laughs) That was my I concern. Also, I'm like, ah, Anne. But then she brought it back. It was always for a reason. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I just, you know, I, part of it too is Rachel was so kind of there immediately and let's be friends and let's do that. And I, you know, a little bit of space is okay. <laughs> I also think there's this sense that Anne was always going to choose Rachel. Oh, I without mean, a doubt. She gives Leo up to the police in part. It's, it's to kind of get the scent off them to kind of mm -hmm. absolve them of any potential wrongdoing in Patrick's death. And mm -hmm. I think that there was never a scenario in which and wasn't going to choose Rachel over Leo, even if that ended up being a kind of catastrophe for them at the end. I think that, and that's one of the things about the novel that I, I'm really, I'm really fascinated by female friendships just in general. And mm -hmm. I, I think that there's this kind of really interesting question of, you know, when are you, when are you willing to choose your girlfriend over the guy you've been kind of casually seeing and, and why would you do that? It well, is those I mean, rich relationships. And I, yeah. so, Sarah King, you've had fabulous comments in the chat. I've loved seeing what you're saying about the juxtaposition with ambition. Um, but ultimately, yes, uh, Rachel could give her more than Leo could. And it also is leaning on, you know, there's a longevity. There's a, there feels like there's longevity more with girlfriends, at least mm. in my own personal experience, than with, a, with someone you're casually seeing. Yeah, Leo's a little replaceable in the grand scheme. Of, no, we love him. He, he's very nice, and I'm sure he's very fun, but um, dude's replaceable. It, there's there's going to be another Leo, but best friends are best friends. And hey, you know, I realized this was going to happen. We were coming up very, very close to our time. But before we go, Katie, what do you really hope readers will take away from the cloisters and Anne and, and what you've done with, you know, female friendships and standing on the lip of this very weird moment in the, like, do you go forward in the world? What is the world? Do you have, what do you want people to know? I think for me, there's two things I want people to take away. First is the question of what can atmosphere make us capable of doing or right. believing, right? When you tell right. a ghost story around a campfire, it's terrifying. When you tell a ghost story in the middle of the day to a friend, it's, you know, easy to laugh off. And so I think mm. one of the things the novel is really asking is if you're in an environment like this, what might you be capable of believing? Right. And then I also think for me, the book is so much about this question of fate versus free will and really how we navigate that in our relationships and in our lives. And so for me, you know, I think a lot of the events happening in the novel are actually sort of underscored by this bigger, broader question. And so I think I want readers really to kind of grapple with that in mm -hmm. their, their own lives, you know, and kind of what their what they think their relationship with fate might be. Um, I think that for me is really the question in a lot of ways I was I was working out in the book. And Shannon, what do you hope readers will take away from the cloisters and book club and, and the whole thing that we do? I do think it, it, it with the lush atmosphere throughout mm -hmm. the book, like you can travel to places without traveling to places. I think mm -hmm. that's the beauty of the written word and, yeah. and what is done so beautifully in the cloisters is you can really feel that not only sense of foreboding, but that sense of atmosphere to your point about what does that make you do? Um, and that's what reading should be. It should be an experience to another place or another time. So I, I think that that would be my takeaway from this book, which is hopefully the first of many. We're gonna get there in a second, but before <laughs> we get there, before we get there, Katie, I just wanna drop a comment from Don Borghese uh, that she shared with everyone. I had the sense that Anne chose herself, Rachel just helped her in the, in the start. And I think that's true. I think Anne yeah. absolutely chose herself and you know, House always wins, right? Oh, <laughs> anyway, but before I let everyone go, um, Harry, can you launch our tiny little poll? Because you know what? This is our last book club event for the year. And audience, if you wouldn't mind just letting us know if this was the first event that you'd come to for the book club or how many you've done or how you heard about us, it would be really helpful for us because we're not going to see you again until wait for it. February. We're announcing our new pick on January 2nd, which feels like a million years from now, even though it's not. And we will reconvene on the first Tuesday in February, which I hope everyone has a really great holiday. So if you guys wouldn't mind doing that while Katie tells us what's next. <laughs> oh, man. You know, um, I've been really superstitious about talking about the next book. I will yeah. say, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, I have a draft completely done. I'm working on revisions right now. Um, and I really, I'll just say this, it's, it's set, um, 
it's set in Italy and it's the story of a family who experiences a, a tragic and very public murder uh, or death, I should say. <laughs> Oops, giving it away. Uh, a very public death 30 years ago and about the family's return to that location in Italy and what happens when a death happens again for the second time and kind of what questions that opens up. And so it's it's really for, I'm thinking about it as a book primarily about family mythology, especially mm -hmm. kind of as it relates to, you know, um, kind of big Greek myths. And so that's really where I'm, I'm coming at it from. Again, it's the sort of question of what stories, you know, Joan Didion always said, we tell our, ourselves mm -hmm. in order to live. And I think it's about the kind of family stories we tell ourselves and the, the mythologies we create within families and and how those can be um yeah pretty devastating when they're upended so okay we can be patient we can be patient although sandra noak is saying february no that's too long sorry sandra sorry sorry but it's just got to be that way but katie what have you been reading lately i mean is there something oh that gosh. you're wild about that that you want to share with folks here that help tide everyone over until february yeah, so I have been reading, first of all, I should say that, um, and I've recommended his books on the Today Show. I love Christopher Bolin, anything he yeah. writes. I love his novels. He's the best They're dude. So incredible. If you like literary suspense, if you want a suspense novel beautifully written, go get a Christopher Bolin book. I have loved, I mean, you can't go wrong with any of them. I've loved them all. Uh, but recently I've also been reading O Caledonia by Elsa. Oh, Bolin, we love, we love that book. Yeah, I had never read it before. It's an oldie but goodie in a lot of ways. Um, I have a copy of it over here, but uh, I've been reading that. I'm I'm a big reader, so I always have mm -hmm. like at least one or two books on the go at any given time. Um, and yeah, and I'm really excited to sort of see what Barnes and Noble's picks are in 2023 too. I I love. We have some we have some cool stuff coming up. And hey, audience, that's Ballen, B-O-L-L-E-N, Christopher. Orient is one of the, that's the first title that pops to mind. There was also- Yeah. I like The Destroyers. Oh, there was a Discover pick. Oh, The, the Destroyers. Destroyers. Yeah. Destroyers and A Beautiful Crime are my two, A Beautiful okay. Crime and Destroyers are my two favorite. But Excellent. Orient is great, and he has a new book coming out in the spring of 23. Too. I was about to say, oh, there, is, there is a new book coming. <laughs> yeah. Love's love. I love him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so now this is where I say thank you everyone for joining us. This was so much fun. Thank you for letting us know how you heard about this because as you can tell, we're really fond of Katie. We want to know what's going on with you guys too. The chat was so much fun watching you guys. Oh, and then uh, Katie, in case you read these messages later, I got Snowden in Lake Tahoe, went to the local bookstore in Truckee. I know where that Yay. is. Uh, they Love sold Chelsea. your book hard and it was an excellent recommendation. So, you know, oh, we can shout out. There. There's that's space so for great. all of the bookstores. So without a oh, doubt, in Truckee, great. California uh, is a really special place too. So, um, oh, you know what? I did have one last question. Yes. What have you learned from your students? You've been teaching art for a really long time and you very specifically call out the fact that you teach rural students about art. And I love that. I really, that is so important. And can I just ask what you've learned from them? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things I've learned from my students is just to stay curious. I really love so much teaching students who often don't have a lot of interaction with the yeah. art world. And so I always have my students, my classes curate an exhibition. And so it's part of sort of their final project. And I love just seeing their creativity and how curious they are and the kind of passions that they bring to the class themselves. It's, it's honestly, it's an, it's incredibly rewarding. The arts connect us all, man. The arts are yeah. the thing that connect us all and keep us going. So on that happy note, I'm going to say thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Katie. This was thank so much fun. You. I would love to keep hanging out with you guys, but you know what? I have to prep for another interview. I gotta go. <laughs> Bye. I gotta go read. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Bye, everyone.